Hello Year 7 and today I would like to just talk through the feedback for the task you've just completed on the Reformation. Now remote learning task 10 was centred on answering the question why was there a Reformation and there were some really really incredible responses to this question and there are just a few things that um, I also want to talk about that were maybe slightly um, well, not quite clear enough in some people's answers or just trying to clear up any misconceptions have about the actual history of the event itself. So the Reformation was when the Catholic Church underwent criticism and change and where we have the birth of a new church and a new kind of variant of the Christian religion known as Protestantism. Now this event is happening across the world and it's happening in different places at slightly different times because of slightly different things. It's happening in what we now call Germany under the influence of Martin Luther, but it's happening in England more under the influence of Henry VIII. But these kind of ideas coincide and they are affected by the other, but actually you kind of have the English Reformation being quite separate to what's going on in Germany. So with that in mind, though, we're just going to talk about the different reasons why there was this change in the church, why there was this huge, really quite cataclysmic event that happened in history, um, and the different reasons for it, the different key players, and a chance to also just have a mind with the history. So, first of all, I just want to really highlight how proud we are, Year 7, of how well you did in this task. Actually, these our conversations in the department, Mrs Braverman, Mrs Sabra, me and Mrs Menhinnick have been really impressed with, with you as a year group and your tackling of this question because it's not easy. It's not an easy historical event to, to learn about, especially remotely. And we are so impressed with how many of you have really, really shone in this task. So really well done. This is a huge thumbs up to you. We are really, really impressed. And just to highlight a few um, got quotes from work. Uh, Josh, you said there was now a challenger to the, to the Catholic Church and the Church of England is still around today. So Josh is referring to the birth of the Church of England, the church that Henry VIII brought in um, because of his need to get divorced. And I just like the way you talked about it being a challenger, this new kind of uh, church being set up and had new followers and a new kind of teachings that did, yeah, challenge the Catholic, Catholic Church and the authority of people like the Pope who had dominated religion uh, for thousands and thousands of years. And suddenly we have this new church which actually has some quite different views about how it should operate. Excellent. Jack, you're talking about here Martin Luther, and you said Martin Luther was disgusted at how wealthy the Catholic Church was, and he believed God didn't care about impressive churches and money. So Jack's referring to Martin Luther's visit to Rome, where he witnessed the kind of the severe corruption and really quite, uh, he saw quite disturbing behaviour in the Catholic Church, whereby people were you know, uh, charging ridiculous amounts of money, through the selling of indulgences, the uh, the tithes, the church taxes, all these things that he believed was not the kind of traditional way you should be a good, good follower of God. This is not how you should behave. And he was absolutely outraged at how the Catholic Church was behaving, which ultimately prompted him to sign sorry, and write and pin up the 95 Theses. Stuart, you said, in addition, the Bible was not in English at the time, meaning the church could lie about its contents. It was only accessible to the wealthy people because they were able to speak Latin. This is a, this is an example of the elitist attitude of the church. Now, another key player in the kind of Reformation is generally criticism about how the church was operating, even amongst ordinary people. Um, from sort of early 1500s onwards, and not just uh, religious men like Martin Luther, Many people were getting very angry at how the church was behaving. And one key reason they were angry was because, yes, church services were given in Latin. And Latin was really a language that only people in the church, only people who were trained in the church, like clergymen, 
could speak and those who were wealthy, but the mass kind of proportion of the population, the large majority of people, like the peasantry, who, as we know, if we think about our feudal system, make up the biggest um, proportion of society, they had no idea what was being said. They did not speak Latin. They spoke common English. Okay, and so they are attending church services. They're having the Bible read to them in a language they know very little. And actually, they didn't think this was fair. And Martin Luther didn't think this was fair. Actually, no. God's teachings should be accessible to everyone. And the point is they weren't. And I thought Stuart's use of the word elitist was just so sophisticated here. Now, the word elitist means that it's just basically thinking about the elite. It's only thinking about the rich and the wealthy. The church only had those people in mind. It did not think or care about the ordinary people at the bottom of the feudal system, at the bottom of society. They did not care about them at all. And so that's another reason why there was this gradual push to challenge the church, to criticise how it was behaving, and to ultimately um, have the Reformation. And Carla, you uh, referred back to Henry VIII again. And of course, we know that there is this key reason, especially in England, that there is this issue of divorce for Henry VIII, who is the monarch at the time, uh, Martin Luther is around. He is desperate for a son, and he knows he can't have a son with his current wife, Catherine, so he asks the Pope to, to divorce Catherine so he can marry Anne Boleyn. However, the church does not allow it. So this kind of dilemma that Henry faces is another reason why there is the birth of this new church. So overall, the way, Year 7, you talked about the role of Martin Luther, the way you talked about the role of Henry VIII, and the way you talked about general um, grievances that the people had towards the church were excellent, really, really well done. And a lot of you were able to talk about them in great detail in your individual paragraphs, so excellent, excellent job. However, there were just a few things that came up um, in work across the year that we just want to clarify with you. Now, it's important here that the Pope is not being replaced with this new church. Yes, Henry VIII set up a new church called the Church of England. He became head of it. Not, it's not a case of him replacing the Pope. The Catholic Church still very much exists. That is not got rid of or anything. It is still there. We just now have a second church. A second church known as the Church of England where we have the rise of the Protestants, the Protestant faith. And it's what quite it's what's quite interesting is that the word Protestant comes from the word protest, okay, and protesting against the Catholic Church. So that's why we have Protestants, okay? So you have two churches, in the Catholic Church the Pope is the head of it, but in the Protestant Church, the Church of England, the monarch is the head of it, like Henry VIII, okay? So Henry VIII wasn't replacing the Pope, he was just he just set up his own church, which he was head of, okay? And this of course made the Pope really angry because you now have his, his authority being challenged for the first time, but... Um, it's still safe to say the Pope is still very, very powerful, but having a monarch now in charge of the church, of an alternative church, was, was worrying. Um, and just to clarify here, some of you sort of got the, the wives the wrong, the wrong way round. Um, Catherine of Aragon was Henry's first wife, and she was the one that could not bear him a son. And... She was the mother of Mary, who you will be looking at um, over the next few weeks. And it was she he wanted to divorce, and so he could marry Anne Boleyn, who would be the mother of Elizabeth, um, the famous Queen Elizabeth I. So neither of them could provide him with a son, actually. So <laughs> um, poor Anne was not long for this world, unfortunately, either. Now, I think a lot of you also talked about how Henry VIII was inspired by Martin Luther and how he was drawn to Martin Luther's ideas. That's not necessarily quite true. I mean, Henry VIII was actually a very loyal Catholic, very loyal Catholic for much of his life. 
and um, did not take the decision lightly to break away from it. And even if, even as he did in public, in reality, he did remain perhaps more Catholic than is seen and always talked about. But that's another story. But you've got to kind of see that the influence of Martin Luther in England is there. Anne Boleyn actually was really important in kind of getting some of Martin Luther's ideas in because Anne Boleyn was a Protestant herself. So yes, Martin Luther and his teachings are being read by Henry and are being kind of affected, are affecting things. But actually on the whole, in England, the Reformation is really started because of the divorce issue, because of the issue of a son. Whereas in the rest of Europe, like Germany, that is where we have the issue with Martin Luther. That is where he is the big, um, the big cause of the change. But in England, it's actually more Henry VIII. So just be careful uh, when you sort of say that Henry was really influenced by Martin Luther. He actually wasn't, un wasn't like loathly. Like, he wasn't in influenced by him a lot, but he was partly. But kind of see them as two separate things, really. The English Reformation happening and then the more kind of the Reformation happening across Europe. Now, another thing that was coming up a few times is this idea of Catholics and Protestants being really quite different in many ways um, and really at opposite ends of the spectrum. They were not that different really at all. Are both examples of the Christian faith. So to be a Catholic and Protestant, you are still a Christian. And if we look at this kind of um, diagram here, all of these represent branches of Christianity. Now you can see in the middle that the Catholic religion or the Catholic branch of Christianity is consistent. However, with the Reformation in the 1500s, suddenly out of Christianity, new branches emerge. New branches of Christianity are emerging. And this is where you have Protestantism. And then out of Protestantism, you have loads of uh, other variants of that, Lutheran, Reformed, Anglican, Anabaptist, for example. So it's important to remember that you are still a Christian if you are Catholic or Protestant. And a lot of the way you you, you worship is, in com is, is similar. However, what is important is, as I talked about before, is the Pope is the head of the Catholic Church, but the country's monarch is the head of the Protestant Church. And in the Catholic Church, they still um, conduct services in Latin, they still have their Bible written in Latin, and the churches tend to be very decorated and very, and very or, ornate and very magnificent. The priests are dressed really in quite um, magnificent robes. Whereas in the Protestant church, everything is done in, a, in the language that the worshippers understand, be it English or German or French. And the clothes and the appearance of the, um, the vicars and the reverends and the priests who do the services is much plainer than it is in the Catholic Church. And you'll learn more about the appearances of the church uh, and how they differ more so over the next few weeks. But it's important to remember that these are all branches of Christianity. These are all examples of different uh, forms of Christianity. Protest being a Protestant and being a Catholic is both, both of them mean that you are still a Christian. Now, Just in terms of structure, um, Year 7, a final thing that we noticed is that sometimes you would just hone in on one reason, like the only reason something happened was because of Henry VIII or because of Martin Luther, or just, just not go into greater development about other possible reasons or other possible um, arguments you could go down. And it's important to remember that actually... You can talk about um, that there are there are more than one reason for things. There are um, cases where different things influence the other. As I've made, said to you earlier, you can talk about how Martin Luther was partially an influence in England, but more a bigger, more profound influence in Germany. Whereas in England, Henry VIII and
and his desire for a divorce has a major impact in England. So I think what I would encourage you to do is to be a little bit more tentative, be a little bit more um, sort of, ooh, uh, I think I can go down this avenue, but also down this avenue. I don't need to just focus on one reason and just talk about that. I could say, well, actually, the reason why there was a reformation was partly because of this, but also partly because of this. And yet the main reason was this. And I think really successful answers are ones that kind of balanced all these different factors, these different reasons, and kind of attempted to prioritise them and saw them in order of how much of an impact they had, how big of influence they had. And I think you said that would be a really kind of uh, useful thing for you to think about going forward is when you think about events in history don't just think that there's kind of one big reason that causes them as you know with other events that you study like the Peasants Revolt for example or the reason why William won the Battle of Hastings there are so many different reasons why there are reformations or why there are events in history and why there was the reformation um, so think about that when you structure your writing Try and also avoid just having basic statements because some of you just didn't extend your points enough. And also just watch out for capital letters. Um, on the whole, capital letters were excellent and Reformation, Henry, Martin Luther, Act of Supremacy were done brilliantly. But there were a few cases where there just wasn't capitals where there needed to be. So please make sure that you keep an eye on that. And overall, Year 7, a really excellent piece of work, really well done, very impressed. And I look forward to um, seeing your work over the next few weeks. Thank you.